good afternoon doctors uh, we from the desk of iow in collaboration with zydus uh, yeah. welcome all the participants i hope uh, we are audible uh, good afternoon doctors uh, we from the desk of iow Uh, yeah. In case uh, not audible, I request you to kindly respond uh, in the chat box. And uh, this is just a technology check because uh, today's lecture is expected to have quite a few videos. So, in case you are not logged on to your Wi-Fi, we request you to kindly log on to your Wi-Fi so that. the connectivity is good and there is no buffering Sir, upon now. Welcome, everyone. Can you all hear me? You change your name, sir. Is my voice clear to the delegates here? Great. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, commands. Uh, now, just a small request. Uh, uh, sometimes, uh, since the transmission is coming from all the way from France. uh we would request everyone to maybe watch the telecast uh, via the wifi if you have one so it will make it uh, that much more clear for you uh, if there are any doubts uh, what i have been told is that professor vincent's uh, talk will be divided into two parts so you have a part 1 and the part 2 so he will be taking his queries after the first part i would be noting down all the queries or you can ask your queries after the first part and type them and we would be putting it forth to them and he can answer it and then we go to the next part he should be here in about 10 15 minutes time he just messaged me he's on the way there and uh, requesting you you all can off your videos okay we have unmuted you see because uh, of the background noise with so many people it would be virtually difficult for us to conduct the meeting but you can also put your video off so you know your picture would not be seen and you would be seeing the 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 picture here as well uh, again as a request i welcome you all here and uh, uh, you all feel free to ask your questions i know we are having a little time going to have a little time shortage here because we start at 3 and we are going to end at 4:30 uh, maximum we can extend it up to 5 o'clock I, i think so but beyond that i think uh, professor vincent has to go somewhere so uh, he won't be able to give us too much time beyond that but uh, i think we in this time of crisis uh, this is something which maximum which we can have and be positive and uh, at the uh, <clears throat> onset i would like to thank you for being here hope all of you are safe hope all of you are indoors hope all of you are taking the necessary precautions and uh, now it's not really a national crisis it's an international crisis uh, by god's grace uh, india is doing much better than the world but Mumbai is not doing so well, uh, but still we are trying, and we are all in those and trying our best. And we pray for all the people who are working along with us, the health workers, and all the people who are also unfortunately uh, not uh, made it and have uh, given up their lives in this whole crisis. So all over here, and also in France, and uh, it's been a very tough journey in France as well. And Dr. Vincent is well aware of it, and uh, he himself uh, was home ridden for quite some time. uh we had to keep it today because uh, he would not he was not so sure if he's going to be here from monday onwards so i thought this was the best time to get him here and uh, share his views and today is going to talk on a very interesting topic of learning from failures so it's it's a very interesting topic where he's going to talk about his different failures which he's faced and uh, he's being honest enough to uh, explain why things have failed in his hands as well so that's the sign of a great surgeon and many of you are of course much more senior than me and aware of uh, all these things 
so in case you all are not uh, you all are having any problem here uh, what you can do is on the on the group chat on the zoom group chat there is a gentle there is a gentleman called mr shishir okay, his name is s h i s h i r shishir kavishwar so in case you are having any issues you can also log on to him uh, and send him a private message that you are not able to see the screen or you are having a specific problem and uh, he will try to sort things out as well and uh, finally we would again of course later on but uh, thanks zaidis shishir mr bhalarao and his team here for uh, this wonderful program here and unfortunately our uh, iow which we host every year is not going to happen this year so uh, we have uh, little problems but we are trying to hold such small academic web events uh, through the web seminars and uh, hopefully it benefits all of us one one and all yes so i hope all of you all of uh, you are able to hear uh, me clearly internet is the biggest problem here but uh, i'm we are trying our best now so can anyone just type if they are able to hear me clearly yeah thank you so much thank you so much and i can see quite a, a few friends of mine was there we have dr kanulal sa welcome dr kanulal from uh, bangladesh uh, dr kumar dr sumit thank you so much we are very senior gentlemen dr vinod shah welcome sir i can see you also uh, welcome for being here today last time uh, you were there as well uh, and i uh, welcome all of you of course difficult for me to take so many names now since we already have about 67 to 68 people logged in so thank you so much all of you and uh, just one small request is my deepest apologies in case i i'm not able to take everyone's questions that's my deepest apology because there are so many people that are going to join here from india from bangladesh from nepal from pakistan from middle east from europe uh, some from the us as well so there are so many people who are joining and uh, i would not perhaps be able to ask each and every one's question to him because with more than 800 people you can understand it's not going to be easy but we will try our best we will try our best surely to put in all your questions together sometimes you would also try to club in two or three questions together so all of you get some some answers to your queries that's the best we can do we would of course uh, ask professor vincent for one more web meeting later on but we thought you know first let him get uh, us one meeting and then we can try to convince him for another one let's see let's see how things are in his in his case because they too are having a total lockdown and a very tough time in france presently yes so now i think it's about 10 minutes time for us to log in and uh, it's very good we have nearly about 79 to 80 people have logged in and uh, uh, it's fine it's thank you so much for being here today so just give me about 10 minutes time i'll just grab a cup of tea and come back and all of you all can also get ready thank you so much awesome hello ho oh, ho perfect yes sir
So good evening, doctors. Uh, this is just a small technology check from the desk of IOW and Zydus. Uh, I hope uh, we are audible and uh, it's quite clear. In case, uh, in case there are any technology issues, uh, you can anytime get in touch uh, with me. My name is Shishir Kavishwar. You can drop into the uh, chat box. Any individual facing a problem, probably I should be able to guide you. Uh, last but not the least, kindly ensure you are on to your Wi-Fi because today's uh, session uh, might have uh, a good quality video which may take some time if you are not logged on to a Wi-Fi video. Although we have ensured that there is no uh, glitch in the streaming of the videos. So hope. We'll start the meeting in another uh, uh, 10 minutes from now. I think any kind of questions uh, will be addressed. Good evening, doctors. Is it clear now? I am getting some messages that uh, the voice is not clear. I hope it's clear now. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Gunjan. Thanks. Uh, once again, good afternoon, doctors. Uh, I think so, Dr. Uh, Manish has just joined in. Uh, Dr. Manish, you're, uh, you're in, sir?
Dr. Manish? Wow. Good afternoon, everyone. Shishir, can you hear me? Yeah, sir. I think so. We can just have a technology check once again, sir, because uh, since it was mute for quite some time, I think so. There was uh, some queries from the group. I hope we are clear now. So thanks, thanks everyone. I think so. Dr. Uh, Minish would be here. Uh, he's already here. We're just waiting for uh, Dr. Professor Vincent. Yo. I think so. Professor Vincent is also here. Um, yeah, I am here. Hello. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. How are oh. you, sir? Well, it's still the morning here in France. <laughs> so, but, uh, morning, sir. Good morning. How are you doing? Uh, going on, sir. We are, we are, as of now, good. Good, and good. Although uh, situation in Bombay is worsening as far as the COVID is concerned, but... Uh, Hello, Shishir. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sir. I think uh, Professor Vincent also here, sir. Hello, Vincent. But COVID is, uh, is doing... Can you hear me, Shishir? Yeah, sir. I'm not able to hear you. Hold on. I need to, I need to change something. Uh, hold on. Yeah, Professor Vincent is here. But yes, I'm not I'm hearing here. the audio. Sir, can you hear me now? Uh, I need something, something more, eh? if you don't mind. Dr. Minish, yes, can you hear me now? But I'm not getting the audio, Shishir. Right. Okay, let me check. Hello. Yeah, okay, I can hear you now. Ata hai toh malarta. Yeah. Ita phone madhe ita sir. Haha. Nain ata hai toh. Now I can hear you. You can hear me, sir. Now I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> ah, good. So, Professor uh, Vincent is here. So, can you hear us? Of course, I am here. I was here before you. You're late. No, no, no. I, I, I came here before and we checked. Everything is all right. We welcomed everyone and we were uh, waiting for you. Come on, come on. You're just waking up. You were sleeping. That's the truth. Uh, <laughs> okay, on this onset, uh, I would just like to welcome everybody here. Uh, we have more than 300 people uh, who are already here. Uh, a small request uh, to all the delegates. Uh, one is, of course, uh, you can try to access this whole program via your Wi-Fi because that would give you a better picture when it comes to the clarity and uh, also the, the audio. Secondly is uh, we have uh, the, uh, Professor Vincent's uh, lecture, which is going to be divided into two parts. So what you need to do is you need to, after the first part, Professor would give us a break and uh, would be answering all the queries which you will be asking. And uh, after that, then uh, we would go to, his, to, the, to the second part. And uh, in case anyone wants to ask a direct question to him, please let us know. So we would be unmuting him. Presently, we have muted all of you so that there would be no background noise and disturbance in the whole meeting. That's the whole aim. Uh, we have people from different countries, from Iraq, from Bangladesh, from Nepal, and many countries, and of course, all over India here, well, to welcome here. At this onset, uh, I would like to uh, 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 welcome Professor Vincent here and uh, thank you for giving your time here. Uh, uh, I would take this opportunity to welcome you uh, to this web conference. You are a, a, a very famous and a very well-known person in India and you love India is all, we, we all know that. You have been my teacher, my guide, my mentor in more ways than one. And uh, on behalf of the whole country and all the people, more than 370 people here, I welcome you and thank you for accepting this invite at this point of crisis. I hope people at your home, at your country, will get out of this problem. And uh, we all hope that we will be safe in uh, days to come. Uh, hopefully, uh, things would improve. And uh, last but not the least, I would uh, like to thank you for being so modest 
so humble and such a true human being, especially to me, helping us out all the time for IOW. And you are an inspiration to so many of the ENTs in India who you are not even aware, but you are a real inspiration to many of them. And all of them are extremely eager to just hear you today. So I welcome you here today and thank you again for being invited here and request you to start the proceedings further. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Manish. That was a very nice introduction and you've got a very nice tie. Unfortunately, I didn't wear a tie. You see, I'm just uh, relaxing a little bit. So I will give a conference in a, in a very relaxing way. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's a great pleasure for, to, for me to participate and to be, uh, to be able to share my experience. And I think what you are doing, uh, Manish, is great. With Shishi make, make organizing this web conference in, in India to link people together in such a difficult time. I think it's very, uh, very important. I mean, we all fight against the situation. It's uh, that probably there will be a new world after that. We have to change a lot of paradigms. I'm sure we have to make different choice. And uh, I think one of the most important thing will be to uh, be able to share even more friendship, uh, more things worldwide. There are so many things that need to be improved in terms of uh, humanity. Unfortunately, I'm not sure that the, the, the human would be able to completely change in their mind, but it's clear that the second part of the world will be different. So, um, well, when we all started having this uh, big issue with this uh, COVID-19, uh, it's a kind of uh, disaster worldwide and we all feel depressed for sure, for people dying everywhere, for old people being alone and dying alone on their own place. I mean, it's something that we're facing just like a, a global war, but it's even worse than uh, the past uh, world wars because it's everywhere, including in a very small village or very small part. So I think it's, it's a kind of really big disaster. And it's clear that we all feel, this, as I said, depressed and we don't want to do anything. We have nothing to do to fight against that, uh, except the, the, the people, the doctors who are in front of the, the real problems with the virus. Uh, which I'm not, uh, of course. Uh, so I'm thinking we yeah. all... Excuse me, Professor, uh, could you be a little louder, please? Your voice is a bit faint. Yes, maybe I can try to... Let me see if I can increase uh, a little bit the sound of yeah, my microphone. This is better. I think when you come a little closer, it was better. Yeah, yeah. But I will... That, oh, that, that's the one. That, that's going to be much better for you, right? Yes, this is better, okay. right. Okay, so... Yeah, so I was saying that I was very happy to be part of this because it's a big thing. And it's the only way for us to fight against this uh, terrible situation, being linked together despite this uh, separation, social distance that we have to deal with. Uh, and that's also something that we are trying to do with Lion. I will say a few words about what we are planning to do uh, very soon with uh, Wilco Groman and other friends. Uh, Manesh, you know, I like you very much. We are very close and I have so many close friends in India. Ashim, I know Ashim is there. I sent, he sent this message to me and other, I don't, I don't want to put the name because there are so many. So it's, it's a, a different way for me to be linked with you, but I mean, it's the future because it's clear that we will have to think about different way of uh, uh, giving conferences now uh, because this problem of the virus situation will not disappear immediately. There will be a big issue with time until we get the vaccine. So it, it's going to be really uh, very difficult to deal with. So uh, maybe I can start now with my talk, uh, Minesh. Do you yes, allow me to start? Please. Yes, okay. thank you. And, uh -huh. uh, and uh, just a, a, a small message to all the participants. You all can put in your, your, your questions. At the end of the first session, we would try to ask as many as possible. We have people coming from Indonesia, from Iraq. We welcome you all from Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, uh, Saudi Arabia. So thank you so much. We have uh, Dr. Janaki Ram here also, the famous uh, skull-based surgeon from India. Welcome here, Dr. Janaki Ram. Pleasure to have you here. And uh, we have some uh, people from the neighboring of France, from Netherlands also. So we have some uh, Dutch uh, doctors here to see Professor Vincent. So it's a pleasure uh, to have all of you here. Thank you so much. Marc, je peux pas te parler, je suis en conférence là. Ben, regarde -le. We have some doctors from Afghanistan. Yes, welcome again. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to switch off my phone. I'm sorry about that. This is uh, very impolite. So I'm, am I ready to start? Yes, please. Yes, please. 
Okay, so I think the guy from Netherlands is Wilco Grohlman, who is the uh, president of Lion, and I ask him to be part of this uh, yeah. because he will be also connected with you for the next conference we're going to do. So you were asking me to speak about um, the uh, problem of learning from failures. That's yeah. the, the talk that I gave in, uh, in January. I think it's a very interesting topic because, what, of course, we all be happy we are all happy with our good results, but uh, we do not learn about uh, our good result. We always uh, learn about the failures. So I think it is important to face the failure, to accept the fact that we can have a failure and to share failures because I learned myself uh, about failures. And so with time now, because I'm, I'm becoming very old. And so of course, I, I got a lot of experience now in middle ear surgery and I'm also trying to uh, you know, present my results. I publish my results in different reviews. And I've got such a big uh, data now that, that I want to share that and specifically focusing on, on failures. So I will speak about what I call middle ear uh, reconstructive uh, surgery. And I'm speaking about three decades. You can imagine that I was there 30 years ago studying my experience for 30 years, that means something. Yeah? Anyway, so I will separate my talk in two parts. Uh, the first one will be talking about my failures on uh, stapy surgery. And then the second one on osteoculoplasty. So what I, I would propose as we discussed Manish before is that after my first part, when I will have finished my first part about stapy surgery, I can stop a little bit and then wait for some questions um, around stapies and then we can uh, continue with the second part and I would be happy to uh, reply to questions about, uh, you know, osteoculoplasty. All right, so uh, this is the cost clinic. So uh, that's exactly the same day today, by the way, it's very sunny and very nice. It's on the, in the south of France, you can see the position uh, so right in, in a region called Occitania, which is between uh, Nice and, and the Spanish border, we don't have too many cases at the moment of COVID-19, but of course it's increasing, but it's not the same as uh, the big issue we have in Paris and in the Northeast. You have heard about that with the crisis that we have in the intensive care unit. Uh, the number is slightly decreasing now in France. We could say that we probably had the peak and it's going to be a little bit stable now, and, but, but, but we need to wait. But we have some good sign. But of course, the problem that we have and you, that you all know is that only a small, very small part of the population will be uh, uh, protected now uh, against the virus because they have been ill. Uh, so the problem will be the deconfinement uh, the when the people will leave their home and it's still under discussion with trying to find the best way. Now, just before I, I start my talk, I just would like to emphasize uh, a big event that we're trying to make uh, next May. Many of you have already received uh, uh, the uh, preliminary program of the original Lion uh, big conference we usually do in May. Uh, that is for May 18 and 19, but of course it was mainly dedicated to uh, uh, life surgery, as you know, originally. And of course, we cannot do life surgery at the moment because all activities in the private and public hospitals have stopped, uh, postponing all the possible surgery later on. So we won't be able uh, to perform life surgery. But I think we were all, as I said at the beginning in my introduction, we were all feeling very desperate at the beginning. And I was very desperate. Uh, and I didn't want to do anything for this line to, to change the, the program or to do something. And uh, Wilco, Wilco Grohlman, who is the president of the line, was pushing me a lot like other friends. He had a lot of energy. And uh, I think it's a really good idea because that's the only way to fight, as I said, like you do with this web conference. And I know that you've st already started doing it in India since now two, three weeks. And I think it's the, our duty to continue sharing expertise. So you see, the point here would be to have uh, several a lot of speakers you can see on the right coming from uh, they will speak about from their own countries uh, of course and the good point i think i was talking about humanity and sharing things between people the point is that we will have speakers from all of these countries 
including China, where everything uh, started from. So I think it's really nice to have these people uh, be part of this. We have Japanese, we have Hong Kong, we have uh, North America, South America, Australia. The point is not only educational program. I must say this is a, a humanity point of view to be uh, able to gather, uh, to speak together and to share experience. Uh, so you will receive some more information on the website very soon with a detailed program. The first day, May 18, will be dedicated to uh, cochlear implantation and neurotology, whereas the, first, the second day, 19, will be dedicated more to uh, middle ear reconstructive surgery, including stapy surgery, osteoplasty, revision cases, and meringoplasty also will be discussed. Uh, this will be by a faculty with a, a kind of panel discussion. And on, on one side with a specific setup and on the other side you will have a virtual conference room and you can see on the website here www.line-web.org it is absolutely important that you go there to register to register to one of the conference room we are setting up it's really a big big setup and, and Wilco Grumman is making a, a huge work on that John Oates is uh, working on the program I mean, all will be, I hope, ready for you. And I really, I would be so happy that you could uh, share that with us and being together, you will be able to participate interactively uh, from the conference rooms, pretty the same as you're doing uh, in this conference. But please go to the website and register so we'll have, uh, be able to follow you. Now, well, let's talk about my subject, which is learning from failure. If you want to have more success, uh, in terms of reconstructive surgery, my point of view is that we uh, really need to move up to from our failures. So we need to face the failure. That's the point. And then we'll be able to jump up to our success uh, rate to try to increase the success rate. But how to do that? I mean, how to be able to understand how, how we failed and how we are able to move from our failure to a possible success the point is that it's clear we need to analyze our uh, results, which means that we need to have a database. That's the point. Whatever type of database we use, uh, I think it is mandatory to have a database to be able to put our patient on that and to do it and to follow our results prospectively in a very honest way and to be able to exactly focus on our failures and try to understand the cause of failure. So the database is important. And just before I'm gonna stop temporarily this presentation, I will come back and I will show you because it's important to explain you how it works and how I was able to um, prepare this kind of uh, talk and uh, publish my papers. I got this database called ONDB, Autology Neurology Database, and I'm gonna show you how it works for example, if I select the pathology on autosclerosis, because this is my first uh, topic there. So what you can see here is that we have uh, uh, on the left, you have some kind of panel with uh, general uh, information. And on the right, we have revision and primary surgery. This is, uh, I have selected autosclerosis. So let's go to revision because I mean, we are talking about uh, uh, failures. So if I, uh, sell, well, let's go first to primary. I'll show you that. We have 622. On the right, you get all the information at the moment for pre-op because I, I haven't selected post-op. So I'm gonna go for post-op now. So we have 5,446 post-op uh, results. And on the right, you have the uh, airborne gap closure within 10 dB, et cetera, the mean airborne gap pre and post-op and everything you need, the mean bone conduction and mean air conduction. And on the left, you have everything you need and you can change all box. So if you want to have a follow up at one year, for example, you can put nine months here and then uh, let's say 18 months and then the follow up will give you exactly the number of people uh, with uh, having already um, a result at, at that stage. Now, if I uh, oh, can I interrupt you for a minute, we need. Uh, is it possible for you to be a little more loud? We have a feedback that you're a little soft. Okay, 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 I will do that. I have a problem with ONDB, so I, I, I may need to... Uh, so is it, is it better if I speak like this? It is, it is, yes. Oh, I have a problem with, uh, with my, my, my uh, 
I have a, I have a problem with my my Mac, so I need to stop ONDB. Otherwise, there will be a big issue there. Okay, so uh, let me see if I can reload uh, reload ONDB. I don't know what it was fixed like this, uh, because that's important for me to show you uh, the part of revision uh, to select the previous. Maybe search. if you need to come a little closer, it's fine. Okay, okay, I do that. I yeah, do this that. Is better. This is better. All you don't right, need to. Right. Just a little closer works enough. Works well enough. Okay. But if I'm if I got closer, you see my face. The old guy speaking now. That's okay. You're you're as handsome as ever. Okay, so let's go back to pathology, and then I, I speak to I, I click on autosclerosis, and then I will click on revision. So now we have one thousand four hundred revision surgery, and I want to select who was the previous surgeon. So I go to clinical there, and I go to go I, I go and select the previous surgeon because I want to study my own failure. So you see here, personal revision. So I click to this link and then in that way, I'm going to study my own failures, but I want to study my own failures following the first operation when the previous operation was primary. So first I will go to previous operation like this, select to autosclerosis primary, and then I've got first personal revision when the previous phase surgery was primary. That's the point. Then I can understand exactly what was the cause of failure. Then, then I go to uh, uh, surgery, and then you have a link there. You see call main cause of failure. So I know all the cause of failure of my, I'm, I mean, my personal failures. So that's important. Then I can select that. Again, I can determine exactly what kind of prosthesis I was using, and et cetera, et cetera. So just a short presentation that was important to show you how it works. Now, let's go back to my talk. Um, if we talk about stapy surgery, we learn from failure again. So I will first, uh, so these are the two parts, autosclerosis and osteoclerosis, as I said, and we're going to start first with uh, um, autosclerosis. So first, if I want to talk about my failure, I just show again the technique I'm using. This is a right here. You know that I'm using a transcanal approach, using a microscope, using an incision from uh, 6 to 12 o'clock. Uh, so I use a round knife like this uh, at the distal tip of the speculum and I use a speculum holder to hold my speculum. So it means that I get two hands free. And you see I'm using a, an elevator on my right hand and the sucker on my left hand. This is why I like to have both hands free. I know many people are moving to endoscopy, which I understand it's a nice tool. But in my opinion, that's my personal view only. Uh, and it's not a criticism. I prefer to have both hands free. So I'm just checking now the middle limb mucosa, opening the mucosa. You see the, the annulus there, and you see the corded tympani. Now I will elevate only the posterior half of the flap, which is the same approach as for endoscopy. And then I like to do the bony rim resection with, uh, with a curette like this in order to expose the facial nerve and the other window. That, I mean, and the main point is to expose the facial nerve, which is the main landmark for me. So I do that until I can see the, the, the facial nerve and, ex, and also the posterior part of the stapes, including especially the pyramidal process. That's the one I like to have in terms of exposure. Next step will be to separate the joint using a small joint knife. And you see I'm using my left hand also at the same time with the circle to stabilize the incus. And then I need to check malice incus. That's important because I want to rule out any malice fixation. That, and in my opinion, that's the only way to set to this differentiate malice fixation up to stapes fixation. You also notice that I was checking the stapes mobility from the top of the head with a with a fine needle. Usually, I I, use, I like to use the laser, and I'm using now the CO2 luminous system with the handheld piece. But in that case, I was I just wanted to show you the the use of a micro drill with a 0.7 millimeter. Uh, diameter diamond dust uh, burr. So I al already drilled out the posterior cruise. Now I'm going to drill out the anterior cruise. And then I will uh, remove the superstructure. Um, so removing the superstructure allows me to have a clear exposure of the uh, foot plate. And I'm going to measure now. I always measure the distance using a measuring device. If I stop the video right here, a little bit before I, I just explained something which is important in my mind. You have three notches here. The distal tip of the speculum of the measuring device should 
uh, be in contact with the foot plate and I'm looking which of the three notch is in front of the incus. And you see that we have the superior one. So it's probably, because this is 3.5, this is four, and this is 4.5. So I will cut the prosthesis at 4.5. And my opinion, it's important to, to, to measure because we have a lot of differences. And in my database, I put the length and we, we, we have difference from 3.5 up to five sometimes. Now I'm drilling out the posterior stabidotomy with the macro drill and a 0.7 millimeter burr and a 0.7 millimeter diameter suction tube. I just leave the diamond dust doing the job by itself, as you can see, and I'm controlling the, ble the, the bleeding and I'm controlling also the fluid leakage later on with the sucker. This is why I'm using only a 0.7 millimeter uh, sucker in diameter. Uh, so I do that until I can open up the, 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 the the labyrinth, you see him controlling the flute uh, using the 0.7 sucker anterior to the stapedotomy. And then I will finalize the opening of the perilymphatic membrane. So uh, this creates a 0.8 millimeter diameter stapedotomy. You see the position of the sucker close anterior to the stapedotomy, but I never, of course, suck into the labyrinth. That's important. I try to control that. You can see we've got some residual for an infanting membrane, I don't want to remove that, that's enough. Then I will cover that with the vein graft, which as you know, I use that all the time. This is the cost technique originally. So the, the, the vein is placed over the foot plate with the adventitial side down to the foot plate. We are now facing the intima of the vein. And this was taken at the beginning of the operation. Now I'm using this type of prosthesis in most of the cases, which is the basic uh, cost teflon piston. 0.4 millimeter diameter, which is cut using a cutting block. And then the next step will be to break the memory of the loop, opening the loop in order to place the prosthesis. So the first step is to introduce the shaft. You see, I'm using the sucker to do that. And then I'm placing the loop around the incus, and then I will crimp the loop in order to secure uh, prosthesis stability. I can also use, you can see on the left, I can also use the um, curve forceps and looking then for the bending sign, the piston should bend but not move. So that's the technique. Now let's talk about the results. I will move from the overall results to, uh, uh, the, to the failure in a minute. General overview of my results, I did uh, from 1991, uh, more than 6,000 primary surgeries uh, with quite an interesting uh, series of children cases, as you can see, 45 cases. And I've got a post-operative available data at that moment uh, for 5,400 patients with a mean follow-up of more than 40 months. Now, um, these are my, again, general uh, results. We have uh, something like 92.5% of su success rate, which is, as you know, defined by airborne gap closure uh, within um, 10 dB. And on the right, you can see the incidence of sensory or hearing loss and uh, complications. The problem is that I have the screen, uh, managed all my, my small screen uh, on the right. And unfortunately, I cannot see completely all my slides. So I don't know if I can, if you can move, uh, maybe I can do it. That's, that's better. That's fine. I've done it. Okay. All right. So um, let me do something. Okay. All right. So now I will go for, uh, so you see, I, I introduced also the, the number of fistula that I have. And fortunately, in my old cases, I didn't have any facial palsy. Now, in terms of failures, because that's the point, the failures are defined, in my opinion, by uh, airborne gap closure more than 10 dB, uh, central hemorrhage loss, 0.5%, and also post-operative uh, fistula. But we, this is the point that we're going to study uh, specifically. Now, these are the line uh, that it represents uh, all my experience over the, the years since 1991. And you can see that the success rate was pretty stable after the first uh, uh, cases. If you see on the left here, that was the beginning. I, I went up and then the average aspect of the success rate is pretty, pretty the same with time, which means that uh, we got a, a, a type of technique which seems to be quite interesting. 
Now let's go to failures. So failures, as I said, is defined by post-operative airborne gap uh, over 10 dB plus post-op sensor and hearing loss more than 15 dB and uh, post-operative fat fixed to that. Um, the overall failure rate on my stapes case is 8.2%. Uh, and you can see the difference. The, the main one is, of course, the airborne gap over 10 dB, 7.5. And as I said, central on hearing loss, 0.5%. And I must say 0.5% is pretty stable with time since I'm uh, using this technique. Uh, important point is the perilymphatic fistula. You know that we try to use this technique of vein graft in deposition to try to avoid the risk of fistula, but you can see that I had some cases. But it's interesting to go back to this point because I got all, most of the fistula occur within my first one or if I don't remember exactly one or two years of experience between 1991, 1992, 1993, and I was able to revise all my cases, which is interesting because I was able to understand why I got this fistula, what was a kind of mistake that I was doing. And in all cases, I remember perfectly, I found that they all occurred from the anterior pole of the other window, which means that I was not uh, stre stretching very nicely and perfectly the vein graft uh, at the beginning. And since I, I knew that, I, I realized that if we use the vein graft in deposition, it is important to spend a little bit of time to stretch the vein correctly uh, before placing the prosthesis. And since I'm doing this, I didn't have any perine fatty fistula since probably uh, something like 20 years now. All right, so I, got, I gave you the average number, uh, in, I, mean, I mean, the average incidence of failures in my whole series, 8% 8, 8 more or less. And you can see now if I'm focusing on specific anatomical conditions, which are defined by a complication in uh, stapy surgery, the first one is according to surgical anatomic presentation. And the first one is obliterative otosclerosis. As you know, this is defined by huge focus of otosclerosis, uh, filling completely the other window up to sometimes the level of facial nerve. So the number I add is one and 128. But you can see the incidence of failures is, is much more important than in my general series, 16.5%. So it's clearly a different one. And also the point is this, this number, which is the uh, post-operative incidence of sensory and hearing loss, 4%. So the failure rate in this type of presentation is much more important in my experience. The second difficult condition is the simultaneous malice ankylosis, which, as you know, is, re is defined by congenital malformation and not by ligament fixation. Um, I got 26 Ks. I'm talking about simultaneous malice ankylosis. It means malice fixation plus stapes fixation. And you can see 42% of failures. It's a lot. And it's uh, mainly related to airborne gap uh, closure. I didn't have any central hearing loss in this series. Uh, so, but there's a way to improve that for sure, because in, it's clear that the problem in that case, I'm using all the time a TORP, a total prosthesis with the malice to stay epidotomy procedure. So we need to have a perfectly accurate length of this TORP. And the main cause of failure, as we'll discuss later in this series, was a short prosthesis because it's not easy to determine exactly the distance from malice to, to state epidotomy. So here I compare the, the failure rate between the three uh, points. On the left, you have the general series. In the, mid, in the, mid, in the middle, you have the operative case. And on the right, the uh, simultaneous uh, malice ankylosis. And you can see the difference between the groups that as this, this slide is kind of a summary of the previous one. So you can compare the three groups and the incidence of the surgical presentation in terms of the failure rate in my personal experience. Now let's focus on the most disturbant part of the failures of complication, which is of course, sensory hearing loss. I think it's important to focus on that. 30 cases, 0.5% with an age you can see from 24 to 78, which means that I had a central hearing loss, even with a young patient, which I think, of course, is really bad. 
So this is the average rate, 99% good, 0.5% uh, uh, sensor and hearing loss, and again, obliterative more, and um, uh, yeah, uh, the young people and the, that's, I think, cannot have access to this. Let me see what I have, because I cannot change that the position of my, yeah, that simultaneous malice ankylosis on the right. Okay, all right. Okay, so now it's more interesting to discuss this point. Yeah, that's better. Now, we have a focus on sentinel hearing loss here. I want to study the timing of the, uh, the occurrence of the sentinel hearing loss following surgery and the severity. Of course, we can define, we can divide two groups, the dead ear, total deafness, and also partial deafness, which means that we have a partial uh, regression, uh, sentinel hearing loss. Most of the time, you can see it was immediate. 93% uh, of cases, it came, it, it occurred following surgery within the following days or immediate. Um, and I also had one case of meningitis. Uh, this, this is, of course, the rare. And this went, of course, to a total dead year. I didn't have any more cases of meningitis, but this means that it can occur. And this patient went well, but I got this. He went, it, it, oh, the surgery went very well. Uh, the, but, um, immediate follow-up was good without any vertigo or dizziness. So he, he, he left the clinic after one week and then after 10, 12 days, he developed a severe dizziness and uh, of course, a lot of fever. He was admitted to intensive care unit and then they'd make this diagnosis meningitis. Uh, fortunately, it's fine now, but it's got a dead ear. That's the point. So you can see the different things. So most of them occurred immediately. Now, the thing is, um, why? Because the first part is to realize that we fail. And the second part is to understand why, why I fail. And once we try to understand why we fail, then we can improve our, 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 our results. Um, so let's go for revision now. I was explaining the results of my primary surgery but now if I want to understand why I fail, I have to go to my revision case. So I did this revision stapedomy again from 1991 to 2019, uh, 1,400 cases. And you can see the personal revision following, I must say personal failure is 198, 14%. But I will focus only on the first personal revision as I explained to you, which is 198. 13%. Um, timing, now, timing of failure of this first, uh, first revision. That was, uh, um, in most of the case, it was a long-term failures. And also short-term, short which is defined as less than one year, and immediate were between 12% and 25%. But long-term failure, 63% of cases, which is, I think, interesting because then probably, and you will see that it's true, that probably the cause of failure that were identified during surgery are not the same between immediate failure and long-term failure. And that's important. Now, these are, again, the operative findings um, during my first revision following my uh, personal uh, failures of primary case. Again, 188 cases. On the left, you can see the previous prosthesis that I was using to, during primary surgery. Uh, and uh, the cause of failure, which I and which were identified um, uh, in the middle. So you can see all these kind of different types of cause of failure. Uh, interestingly, we need to focus on this part because I mean, against eroded incus or against unknown for cause of failure, which means unknown means that when I was doing revision, I could identify why it failed. It means that I found a prosthesis which was clearly in good position with the good bend inside, a good round, round window side, a nice mobility of malice anchor. So I was not able to identify the cause of failure. And interestingly, when I was facing this kind of situation or, or when I do that also after a revision following previous upper surgeon, if I do not identify any cause of failure, any clear cause of failure, in the past sometimes I was still changing the prosthesis. But if I study my results uh, between changing the prosthesis to another one and don't, don't doing anything, 
I don't have any difference in terms of success rate. So now I know that I don't change the prosthesis if I, do, if I cannot identify the cause of failure, because of course, if you change the prosthesis, then you have to recreate a new fenestra, and then there's clearly a risk of central and hearing loss. So I prefer not to be moving it. So let's focus on the middle, because between dislocated incus, short incus, long incus, malleus ankylosis, obliterative, uh, 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 obliteration of the upper window and fistula, these three, six types of cause of failure, I believe these kind of things could be improved uh, by changing, altering my technique. Uh, so this is why I'm, I'm going to focus on that. So let's talk about the first one, prosthesis dislocation. Why, how can I improve that? The most important thing for me is to be able to place the prosthesis on the right position. And if I use this kind of Teflon prosthesis, we'll really need to uh, crimp uh, the uh, loop of the piston around the incus. Because we know that the Teflon has a memory, so some people would uh, just believe uh, to and trust the memory, but I think it's not good. We really need to crimp the, the loop of the piston around the incus there like this, or with the curb, uh, curb forceps. And I think by doing this with decreased risk. And when I had prosthesis dislocation, I think it's because I didn't close completely, uh, clearly the, the loop of the piston. First point. Now, second thing, short or long prosthesis, it's a question of measuring. It's a question of determining accurately the distance uh, between the incus and the, and, and the state peaceful plate. I know that many surgeons say, they don't want to measure, they're going to use 4.5 millimeter prosthesis length all the time, which in my series is true. It's the uh, most frequently um, uh, discovered length, the most frequent length, 4.5. I would say something like it, I don't remember. We could go to my database because all the length are in. It's uh, something like 70, 75% of cases are 4.5. But I have patients uh, with three millimeter and I have patients with uh, more than five even sometimes, but not, uh, clearly five. So it means that if we put 4.5 millimeter in those patients, it will be too long for some of them with vertigo, or it will be uh, too short for the people who have more than 4.5. So, it, I mean, it's important in my opinion to measure and to spend some time to measure the distance uh, from the foot plate to the incus. And I'm using usually, uh, I would say the mid surface of the incus uh, to determine exactly the length. Uh, and then, of course, uh, looking for the bending sign is a clear, easy sign to be sure that the prosthesis is on the right position. Uh, I mean, this is the bending sign. The, the piston should bend, but not move. If it's too short, you will see that the, the shaft of the prosthesis will, will go away easily from the other window. Now, let's go like this. This is on the left. Uh, the, the first part of my, the last part of my, my operation, everything looks fine. I'm introducing now the prosthesis in a good position and I'm going to crane the loop and I'm happy about that. So we can stop, I think, the surgery, but I'm going to look now for the bending sign. That's a left ear and I will go to the shaft and by pushing the shaft, I will check. And you see, that's completely different. The, the shaft goes completely away from the other window. That's a clear proof that my prosthesis was too short. So you can see that the French doctors sometimes do mistake also. So I have to remove this prosthesis. And then I put another one on the right. And you see with the same patient, longer prosthesis, because I measured, of course, again, and uh, I put a 4.75 maybe uh, uh, if it was 4.5 before, and then closing the loop and then lo looking again for the, for the uh, um, bending sign. And in this case, you can see a clear difference. This is a good bending sign compared to the previous one. So the measuring between the foot plate and the incus is, in my opinion, a very important step to increase the success rate from 75 to more than that. And I think this is a small detail, but I think uh, having better results, it's because you're working in the small details, teeny details that you can improve. Uh, we all get 75% easily, but if you, can, if you want to get more than 80%, then you have to work into details, I think. It's not a question of being a better surgeon than the other. It's just a question of uh, giving you my experience to be sure that we do the best.
Now, the vein graft is to, in my opinion, but this is debatable. I know that because uh, many surgeons don't use anything to interpose and they are happy with and they say they don't have any perinfatic fistula. But in my experience, I prefer to use uh, something to seal the labyrinth and I always use vein graft and not perichondrium or fascia because that's, in my opinion, a too thick and not as nice as vein graft. And you can see that I'm spending a lot of time to stretch the vein. I'm holding the vein with my left hand and the sucker. And on the same time, I'm stretching the vein uh, to be sure that I'm covering completely the entire upper window. As I said, that was the problem at the beginning because I was not stretching the vein correctly here. And all my uh, fistula that occurred during my first two years of experience, when I revised them, they all occurred from the entire of the of the upper window. Now, um, if I have something like that also, if I want to, to stretch the vein, you can see that there is some residual posterior cruise here. We need to drill out this small residual part of the posterior cruise, because if I don't remove it, I will not be able to uh, stretch the vein correctly. So you see that before, before performing the stapedotomy, I drill out this posterior cruise. And then only then I will be able to perform the state only. That's important. That's another very teeny details, but I think it's important to show my, my tricks. The other cause of failure is the malis ankylosis. It means that if it's a short-term failure, it means that uh, I, I made a mistake by diagnosing. So for me to do that, you need to separate the incus from the stapes prior checking or secular chain mobility. Otherwise, it's not very easy to determine to make a, a difference in diagnosis between malice ankylosis and, and, and stapes ankylosis if we do not separate the joint. Why is it like this? It's because when you have a malice ankylosis, as has been shown in different papers and publication, I published a paper on that, we have a kind of lever effect made by this malice fixation. So it, it, it's kind of a pushing a little bit the stapes down and this could create some false impression of stapes fixation. It's not a major issue if you have a simultaneous malis and stapes fixation, but if you have, if you have a difference in diagnosis, having a, a fixed malis and a mobile stapes, and if you don't check correctly, you will think that you have a stapes fixed, then you remove the stapes arch, and then you'll find a mobile foot plate and a fixed malis, which is not the same. So I would say, in my opinion, that it is important to separate the joint first and then to check the ossicle chain mobility, malice incus first, and then stapes. So I'm checking it right here, malice incus first, and then the stapes. The stapes I check it from the top of the head, as you can see. So there's on the left, the, the true life surgery, and see the uh, fixation of the stapes. So, so we have a simultaneous malice and stapes ankylosis here. So this is definitely a case of uh, malice ankylosis, which was not fine by the previous surgeon. This is not a personal revision, but you can see that here I found that the state is, the, the, the procedure was fixed. So by the way, that's so, sorry, that's a personal revision. So the personal failure, you see the vein graph, which is nice, but I missed up probably this malice ankylosis during the first operation. You see that definitely the diagnosis is there. Let me go back to the beginning, it's a short uh, clip, but it's nice to show that everything, oh, sorry about that. Everything looks fine, but you see the process is nicely attached. The shaft is in position, the good bending sign, but I'm gonna check now the malleus and clearly the malleus is fixed. So that is the cause of failure. This I know can occur uh, following uh, uh, following years or immediately post-op. If it's an immediate post-op, of course, it means that you made a mistake. That was my case, but it could be a long-term failure. Sometimes the malice can be can become fixed with time. Now let's talk about obliterative uh, autosclerosis, and I'm, because I'm talking about failures and revision, we talk about re-obliteration of the over window, and you can see a very nice photo here of the video showing this huge obliterative autosclerosis uh, filling completely uh, the other window. I will show you the way I deal with this. Again, I'm not saying that's the best way. I'm just saying, I'm just showing what I'm doing to try to give you some advice. The different thing is the way I'm drilling out this type of biscuit foot plate. I'm not performing a straight force stabilotomy, but I just leave a diamond dust doing the job by itself without any pressure. 
to try to progressively decrease the thickness of the foot plate uh, with time. And it's important to use saline solution step by step because the risk if you do it too strongly would be to hit the labyrinth. And of course that would be a disaster. So I think it's important to spend your time. And then only at the end, I perform the finestra. And the same technique, same kind of technique using 0.7 millimeter per and 0.7 millimeter uh, suction tube. Then the, the measurement will be, will be performed at the end after having performed the step it only. Why is it like that? It's because if we measure only at the beginning, it means that we don't care about the, the deepness of the thickness of the foot plate and the step it only will be lower, of course. And then you can cut the process too shortly. Uh, this is my incidence of, of over window reobliteration in my personal series. You can see 4%. Now, this is typically uh, reobliteration re of the over window. And in many cases, I found this type of presentation with this process completely slipped away from uh, the Incas because probably the pr process of the reobliteration was pushing uh, the, process, uh, the process away. So that's a left ear. We have a, a small erosion of the increase here, but it's good enough. So I'm going to use again a piston in this case or a bucket prosthesis. We'll see. So I remove the prosthesis and then we're going to go and keep going on with the foot plate. I can see that many people try to ask questions. If you can just wait the end of the first part of the presentation, it would be nice. So I'm measuring now, but of course I will have to measure again at the end. So I'm going to start the pr procedure now using a combination of laser and micro drill. But I must say that if we have an obliteration of the other window, the laser doesn't work very well. So clearly we have to drill. The laser helps just to decrease the bleeding and to uh, vaporize uh, a little bit of the fibrous tissue, but it's clear that the final point will be to perform the state only with micro drill. So I'm measuring now. And now I will start the process of the uh, drilling out. And you will see what, I'm, what I was saying. So low speed drill, first, first point. Uh, we don't have to perform that too strongly. So I just, as you can see, no pressure, just leaving the bird doing the job. And I'm also enlarging the drilling. That's the uh, very important point in my mind. I don't want to perform a straightforward David on me. I just enlarge the drilling um, uh, much, much uh, widely than I usually do. Uh, and I do that progressively, step by step, uh, until I reach the blue line, which is the burn lymphatic membrane. Uh, Sometimes I use the laser, but as I said, this is not that efficient. Um, I use this circle on my left hand again with a suction pedal with the negative pressure, and then go back with the micro drill. Uh, or originally, if you have a, a regular a basic foot plate, it takes something like a few minutes to perform the stapedotomy. But if you have an obliterative case, it could spend, you could spend one hour sometimes to perform that, but that's not a problem. I really believe if you do it too quickly, too fast, then there's a high risk of uh, fracturing, mobilizing the foot plane and having lots of problems. So it's better to wait. And, and, and you see that I'm, I'm stopping point, step by step uh, at some point the, the drilling because I don't want to hit. And if you stop, you decrease the heating, of course. So now I think the fenestra is nearly performed. And then I should be able to measure. And now we get the right length uh, between the incus and, and, uh, and the, um, and, and the stake dotomy. Now this is the vein graft the position introduced with the incus, with the sucker and fixed with the needle like this and the suck and, and, the, and the, um, the needle like this and then crimping it. Uh, we Okay, so that was my first part of stapy surgery. So we may stop and Manesh, um, I, I, can, I think we can go for questions if you want. Yes, uh, first a, a few questions uh, from my side because I don't get chance later to ask you. Uh, one is in obliterative autosclerosis. Uh, do you find or have you seen cases of revision obliteration that have occurred after a few years? If so, uh, or what could be the reason? Is there any way we can prevent that? Well, that's a good question. I don't have a clear answer for that. I just give you my personal feeling. As you know, we, we give to all my patients I give in the cot clinic, we give fluoride treatment. There is no evidence 
Right. We talk a little bit about evidence for COVID, but that's the same point. But there's no evidence at the moment to be sure that the fluoride is efficient to prevent uh, re obliteration or to prevent the evolution of otosclerosis also in the cochlear. But I believe it works because I have a lot of patients that I follow with that. And I can see the difference between people who are don't who are not taking the fluoride or stopping the fluoride with time and people who are keep going on. It clearly seems to me that the fluoride works. And it's a, but it, I, I, I say this is not scientific proof. I, I, I agree, this is not a proof, but that's my feeling with 30 years of experience coming up from previous years from Jean Benard, of course, and his father. And I can see a clear difference. There was a paper a few years ago in otology, neurotology. They were studying the presence of enzymes in the cochlear fluid, and they found a difference of incidence of, uh, of uh, fluoride into the uh, fluid with or without treatment in favor of fluoride. So I, I clearly believe it works. And uh, uh, one more question is with the, with, with the vein graft in obliteration, uh, would it sometimes be easier not using a vein graft in, in, in obliteration because sometimes uh, the space or the, or the tissue is just too thick or the bone is just too thick to have the vein graft and be sure, doubly sure that the piston is going in the right place? Yeah, but th this is why I, I was uh, pointing out the point that I'm, I'm, I'm drilling out the foot plate in a different way. I'm not drilling out like this, but I'm drilling out, enlarging the drilling to make the whole foot plate thinner and thinner and thin, and then we got a thin foot plate at the end, and then you can perform the stapitotomy, and then you can use the vein graft. Right. Uh, now we have a, 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 a lot of lot of questions here. Uh, one is, of course, we have questions from Dr. Vijendra, our common uh, friend. My friend, my friend yeah. Vijendra. He knows everything about stapy surgery. He's one of your great surgeons in India. Yeah. And happy he's there. Yeah. So uh, actually, I would unmute him as well. But his first question was, what would you think would be the chance of meningitis which you have got? What is the reason you felt it was meningitis? And when would you use a skeeter? Do you, uh, use it? you mean, I mean, it was one case up to 6,000, which is extremely rare. I don't know. We don't know about that. Really don't know. I don't have any ideas about that. But of, co but of course, the thing is that we are opening up the, the inner ear and there's a risk of connection with the brain at one point or something like that. And that's, of course, an infection. Uh, due to uh, the surgery itself, for sure. But I cannot explain why I got that before. Yes, there are a lot of interesting questions now. Uh, there's one question from a doctor who doesn't want you, me, to give his name uh, because he says, uh, you would know it, uh, but he's a very good friend of yours. And he says that though your results are excellent, uh, would, the, would the length of the vein graft, uh, uh, the length of the piston differ with the vein graft? I mean, is it the same? Or is it different when you have a vein graft in place? Uh, well, I, I cannot answer to that because I, I use the vein graft all the time. So I cannot compare. Yes. Um, what I mean is that, what I think is that the vein graft will help you probably if sometimes you uh, create a, a little bit too short prosthesis, the vein graft will increase a little bit the, the kind of length of, of the reconstruction the, the, and, and it will help for the movement of the labyrinth fluid. Uh, I do always the same. I measure, I need to touch the foot plate with the measuring device and see, and I, I use the meat part, the meat surface of the incus. And then I, I, I use this length. Yeah. We have a lot of other questions. Uh, uh, if you have a patient of, uh, from Mr. Dr. Shekhar, if you have a uh, patient of a subluxated foot plate, which is not able, you're not able to retrieve in the original position during the course of the surgery, would you, uh, a subluxated foot plate. Sorry, I, I missed that. Say it again, Manesh. Yeah, you have a patient with a subluxated foot plate. Uh, 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 would you still go ahead with a vein graft or would you abandon the procedure or what would you like to do? In my opinion, in this case, it's better not to try to remove the floating part of the foot plate because there's a high risk if you dislocate the foot plate that uh, part of the foot plate or the whole foot plate could go down into the labyrinth. So in that case, I will continue, but I will use the vein graft because the vein will protect. Uh, and, and I put the vein and I put the processes in between. Usually when you fracture, when you see a fracture, you can see the fracture in the, mid, the middle of the foot plate or in one of the third part. So then you have a, a gap between the fixed part and the, and, and, and the uh, dislocated part. And then you can put the, the, the piston in this, in this area. Right. Now, another question from Dr. Ashim Desai. Uh, would you like to uh, uh, do a CT scan for every revision 
steepies or you do it routinely? Rashim, of course, as you know, is one of my uh, brother in India. Eh? So I'm happy he's joining us today. He sent me a nice message before. Uh, yes, uh, I don't, I, well, in, in fact, my, my answer will be dual. Okay. Um, um, in primary surgery, we mandatory now in France to perform a CT scan preoperative. I don't believe it's a good idea because I don't really need, I don't think we really need it. And I think it's, it's quite a bit of stupid things, but you know, we have people in uh, some offices in France, in, in Paris, sometimes they don't operate and they decide for us. But anyway, I have to do it because it's a law. And if we are sued by, uh, by a patient and if we don't do a CT scan, then there will be a problem because the judge will ask you, why didn't you do the CT scan and so on? So the CT scan is mandatory now. But if you ask me, I wouldn't do it from primary, but for revision, I always ask since the beginning because right. it helps you to determine exactly and also has fast for children. So we have one more question from Dr. Vijendra, and I would request Sir to come online and speak himself because we've unmuted him. Sir, are yeah. you there? Dr. Vijendra, sir? Okay, so uh, I think this is a problem there. Anyway, he, he also uh, asks that whenever you're doing a STP, there are small bits and pieces of uh, bone that- Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah, can you hear me? We are waiting to hear you. Yeah. Yeah, see, when we did the fenestra and all the cases I saw bits of bone were left behind. Usually I use a 0.2 mm pick and try to remove that. So what happens, I have seen that when you use a skeeter, a piece of bone does suddenly if it goes into the vestibule, these patients I have seen post-operately they complain of dizziness and also there'll be a bit of sensory component will be there in these patients. So that's why I don't like to leave that, I try to pay. But I saw, sir, almost left all those bone pieces. What is his uh, view about this? Hello, Vijanja, how are Hello, you? Hello, sir, how are you? Fine. Very Thank beautiful you. presentation. I enjoyed, really, it is a very uh, great presentation to present our failures. Even I am trying to do that. Really, it is a, a, a very good, uh, pleased to see this, uh, our own failures and to... I think it's important to speak about that, you know? Yes, very, very great, great presentation. I, Thank I you very much. Uh, nice to see you anyway. I had a good picture of you. I don't see your video, but I see a nice picture. So, Thank uh, you. Always good to meet you, uh, even virtually. It's nice. Uh, well, I don't have too much problem with that, to be honest. I have some, it, it happens uh, very frequently that we have a little bit of uh, small... Uh, bone dust probably floating into the, the fluid uh, in, the, in the vestibule. But because I put the vein graft, I think they probably stay uh, over. I don't know, but I don't have too much problem with that. I don't try okay. to remove it. Okay, okay, okay. Probably they get stuck to the vein graft. How is it in your side in, in, with the COVID? Is it fine or stable? No, what I do is usually I don't leave that. I try, take that 0.2 mm fish pick. Uh, Oh, so he's asking, gently, he's asking about that. the COVID. He's asking about the Corona. Corona, okay, okay. Corona at present it is uh, uh, safe in my place, not in uh, Jueka place. I know. That's why I'm sounding a little different. Uh, anyway. no, no. <laughs> uh, so there's one more question from Dr. Kanu Sa from Bangladesh. So he asks that is there are two questions. One is uh, there are reports of preserving the stapedial tendon. One is that in your experience, have you ever tried that? Does it really help? And the second question is, uh, does doing the stepidotomy also prevent further progression of the disease to a certain extent? Uh, for what? The second one is what? Uh, that's after the surgery. Are you yes. also in a way preventing the progression of the disease? Yeah. So the first question was uh, about the, remind me the first one? <laughs> uh, the stepidotomy tendon preservation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we, in the past, with Jean Bernard, of course, trying, he was trying to, uh, yeah, um, to start a technique of not preserving, but rebuilding the stapes tendon. So we were using a, a kind of a polycell platform, which was already connected to the shaft of the prosthesis. And then we cut the, the uh, stapes tendon as long as possible. And then we reconnected uh, this stapes tendon to this platform with a stick of, uh, of, of you know, very, very venous uh, connective tissue. But it didn't work well. I mean, it was making the surgery more complicated. Uh, polycell, as we know, is not very well tolerated by the uh, middle years sometimes. And also post-op, I didn't get any difference 
in terms of uh, patients feeling and a recording of the post-op, uh, um, you know, reflex. So I start, I, I stopped doing it. I think if we try to think about that, probably preserving the state piston might be better, but you know, I don't think it's going to change very much for the patient. Uh, there are not really many patients complaining about sound, uh, even only after, uh, I mean, first few days, but it disappears very fast. And I, I don't think it's, it's nice because it's making the surgery more complicated. I'm sure Vienja, you think about the same, right? You said yes. Yeah, Jendra, the same, same idea. Yes. Uh, now there's one more very interesting question we have from Dr. Jagdish Naik from Oman. And in this uh, era of, uh, of lockdown, here's a very interesting question. After STP surgery, when can a patient have sex? <laughs> because a lot of patients was, and no, we are not talking about the, no, about the Frenchman. It's it's a Frenchman. No, it's a nice question. Of course, that's a really good point. Pa a patient is asking about that, and you know, when I was uh, a young uh, intern in my, uh, uh, first of all, say hello to to my friend from Oman. Uh, we met and we had a good time in India when we were together in, in January. Yes, uh, Jagdish, yes. A nice, 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 very nice person. Um, uh, my professor, uh, he was doing a lot of uh, ear surgery, and there was a question like this, and it was a funny answer. He said, well, it depends if you have sex with your wife or with your mistress. <laughs> so that's an interesting <laughs> point. Well, for me, it's not a problem to, to, to have sex for stop. I don't, I don't say any, anything bad about that. I think they can do whatever they want. Right. So, uh, what is your opinion about uh, how long do you give sodium flu? Oh, I have, say it again. I, I had a bad connection uh, now. The, the, the sodium fluoride therapy, do you give it? How long do you give it? Uh, well, usually when I see the patient, each time I made a diagnosis, even if I do not operate it immediately, I start fluoride treatment. And I keep going on for uh, many years, usually. I don't stop until uh, I'm quite sure we have uh, something like probably around eight to 10 years of treatment. So you can see I'm using it for a long time. It's a very, you know, it's uh, only two milligrams and two milligrams per day. Uh, in France, it's called Zima Fluor, but I'm sure you can find it in a different way. Yes, there's one question from Dr. Salman Al-Habib. Uh, any experience of using bone cement for uh, 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 after necrosis of the long process of the incus? No, I never, I never use it. It's an interesting question because I know that many surgeons are trying to do that uh, and it seems to work with them, but I don't have the experience about that. I prefer to use, uh, in that case, uh, uh, TORP, Maddie's to stay epidotomy. My feeling is that if we have this fixation, this it, it makes a fixation maybe of the of the full, of the prosthesis with the bone cement. So I'm not totally happy with that, but I must say I don't I'm not experienced with that. Right. So uh, one more question is that: Do you have any experience of, on reverse tepidotomy? No. You don't do that. No. Uh, we also have an interesting gentleman here who's going to be part of us in the near future, Professor Badraldin from Egypt has joined us. Yeah, I, and, know uh, well. I know very well. Say hello to him. Yes. And uh, uh, one of the important thing here is that uh, he asked that about lifting weights and things like this after surgery. How long and when do you do it? Lifting, lifting what? Sorry? Weights, lifting weights after the surgery. Decreasing the weight? No, no, no. no. Lifting up heavy weights. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, one month for this kind of things. One month for this, one month for flying uh, and, and making high, uh, high level sports. I ask them to stop for one month. Right. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jan Kiram. He's a, a, a famous skull based surgeon here. Uh, he actually asks about your experience about drilling uh, the anterior of the, the, the suprastructure, uh, we generally don't drill the anterior crust. Can we just drill the posterior one and knock off the anterior one by pressure? But it's clear that if you look the anatomy of the state is the posterior crust is always much thicker than the anterior one. So in many cases, yes. I, I believe it's easy to, to probably break it. But I never do it because there's a risk. 
some cases that you can dislocate the foot plate. So I prefer to drill out also if I can the anterior cruise, but it's not always easy. The, the good point, of course, we have the laser and the laser, you have this, uh, you know, this tip, which is uh, the distal tip of the hand that piece is bent like this. So you can reach the anterior cruise. Um, for example, if you look like this, with this represented of, of the stapes, if we have the posterior cruise there and the anterior cruise there, with the tip, the posterior cruise is easy. The anterior, we have the distal tip, which is bent, and then we can touch the anterior cruise and then vaporize the anterior cruise. And then, then we, this will help. But it's not always easy because sometimes we have a very narrow of a window, the asymphatic nerve. So it happens to me that I break it, of course. But I would say if we cannot break it, it's better. Yes, good. There's a question from Dr. Mohammad Hamad. He asked that uh, could revisions where you didn't find a cause for a, a third window effect or the essence of the superior semicircular canal be a reason? Have you encountered, encountered that? Absolutely. I didn't say that, but that's true. Yeah. At the beginning, when it was not known, of course, I, we didn't ask too much. And so we, we didn't think about these kind of things. But now we know that. And of course, now we do CT scan before and we identify the, the essence. So I don't do revision in that case. But it's probably true that for some of the uh, patients when I didn't find the cause of failure, it was probably so for some of them related to these kind of problems. Yeah, so one question from Dr. Shinde, so he always asks something different. Uh, there are reports of alindroid instead of sodium fluoride. Do you have any experience of it? And again, because the beginning was not good for me. Uh, there are reports of patients using alindroid instead of sodium fluoride. Uh, no, I, I, I probably, I, I know that some people, now there's a good, very nice papers about uh, diphosphonate, which seems to work very well, but I don't have my experience with that. And I, I remember, I think probably you remember the talk from um, uh, Osvaldo Lascio Cruz from Sao Paulo, who was using that and is having a very nice paper on that. He, he gave this presentation in, in our course in Bézier where you were here. Right. Uh, one last. Uh, That's Dr. Manish, we are, your voice is breaking, Dr. Manish. Few questions, they are never ending because we just. Think the, yeah, is it? Uh, okay. Sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Manish, your voice is breaking, I think, so the signals are red. Okay. Is this, yeah. is this somewhat better now? Uh, no, your signals are still red, so. Probably. Okay, okay, I think this should be better now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, the, the, the question was, if you have an overhanging facial nerve, are there cases, places where you have uh, uh, abandoned the procedure or you have not gone ahead with the procedure? In case of uh, uh, stapy surgery, I'm not talking about congenital. I'm talking about toscarosis. I never had to uh, abandon the surgery. Uh, because even when the facial nerve comes in contact with the, the stapes superstructure, one, we remove the stapes superstructure, we, we can have a better gap. And even if it's extremely narrow, what the technique for me is to drill out the promontory on the right to have access to the full plate in the deep. Uh, it's a specific technique. I know that Dr. Via Gendra, we, we, we were speaking about this point, he's doing the same. Yeah. I had to abandon surgery. In very few cases of congenital malformation where the facial nerve was really running completely over the, the foot plate. And of course, in that case, there's no way to deal with it. Uh, uh, Dr. Vincent, I think so. We have lost connection with uh, Dr. Minish. So what we can do is we can uh, continue with the second part of your talk. And okay. uh, till the time, uh, Dr. Minish is just figuring out his uh, Wi-Fi connectivity. Okay, great. Okay, let's go that. Let's go that. Uh, Okay, I just want to pull full screen to see if you can see that. Uh, all right. Okay, there we go. So um, this is the second part of my talk. I'm talking about now uh, ossicular reconstruction. And you will see that um, for this type of part, the question of learning from failure is much more interesting than the, the, the first part of stapy surgery, because definitely I learned a lot in my personal experience from experience from my uh, failures. And I was able to uh, introduce and publish new techniques of ossicular reconstruction. 
And I was able to do that because I was using this, net, this uh, database, which I show you, uh, in order to uh, compare my results between the previous technique and the uh, new technique. So let me come back one second with, uh, uh, I just want to go out of that for some second, because I, I just want to show something again with the ONDB. Uh, so I will share again the, the screen in a second because I want to go with the, um, there we go. You have the, the surgery result here. I go to my uh, osteoplasty session just to show you. So we're gonna go for uh, uh, osteoplasty reconstruction, this one. So now we have all my data regarding tympanoplasty uh, and I will go for osteoplasty. So you see, for example, if I select primary uh, revision or revision surgery, same thing. I will go now to, uh, uh, to the clinical and then the previous surgeon, same thing. And to understand how it works, personal revision surgery. So personal revision uh, chronology, I, I'm going to select my first per personal revision like this. So we have 568K. And for the same reason, I will be able to uh, study the type of the timing of failure, you see, and the type of uh, reconstructed ID. And you can study that according to the different uh, technique. So if we go back to this part, to uh, surgery result by pathology, Let's go for, again, the same thing. And I will go to primary surgery. We go now for surgery. And I will, you know, I select, I use the classification of Austin, Austin Cartouche uh, group to determine what kind of presentation we have between group A, B, C, and D. You know that this is a classification which is easy according to the anatomical condition. Group A is malice and staples present, etc., etc. So if I want to study my results in Austin Cartouche Group A, I will go for A. And now I need to use, I need to compare my results between the previous technique and the new one, which I'm going to talk about, which are silastic bending and malice relocation. So I need to go to surgery and I want to study with the uh, uh, technique of uh, malice relocation plus silastic bending. So first I'm going to select malice relocation and I will add Silastic bending. So we have 362 cases like this. And if I go now to uh, post-op on the right, we get immediately the post-op results. And I, as I explained to you, I can change the follow-up after one year, two years, three years, etc. Then I do the same. I go back to the to the series and I, I, I deselect my list relocation and silastic bending. I can also do that by the use of the choice of the prosthesis. For example, you the difference between torps and porps. So if I just want to, to use to study this one, I get the result for the TORP only. Anyway, that's what's just the, the reintroduction of this uh, database, because I think it's important to show you this. So we go now to uh, my failures in osteoculoplasty. So these are the different groups I'm, uh, I'm defining, well, I'm not defining, Austin Cartouche, they have defined that in several groups. It's not a perfect classification because there's some part of uh, presentation which are still missing, but I mean, it's an interesting one. So group A is defined by presence of myelis and stapes, group B by presence of myelis and absence of stapes, but the stapes full plate is mobile. The group C is uh, stapes present, absence of myelis and uh, incus. And group D is the, the worst one with absence of myelis and stapes. And then we have the group F, which is defined by stapes fixed, but we should have a subdivision of group F, which is even worse than the group D. If we have absence of malus and stape is fixed, which happens sometimes in cholesteatoma or tympanosclerosis, and as my friend Via Gendra knows so much about tympanosclerosis. Now, these are again uh, the, 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 my stu the study that I'm going to show you. That's again a prospective evaluation from 1991 up to end of uh, 2019 with the database. And I'm using I'm, I'm studying the failures, which are defined in osteoplasty by post-op more than 20 dB plus extrusion plus sensor on a hearing loss. And you see we've got close to 4,000 cases of osteoclear reconstruction. Um, so we will focus on group A, B, and C. 
1,900 cases with the mean age and follow-up, as you can see, 39 months as a mean follow-up. And we've got 1,700 post-operative uh, data. These are the, the three groups. Now, can we talk about results over time? Well, same as for stapy surgery, you can see it's an interesting figure. You remember that the figure that I show you for stapy surgery was about the same from the beginning to the end. There was no quite difference. You cannot improve that much or decrease that much. But if we look to my figure uh, on ossicle reconstruction, there is a clear difference. Two parts, you can divide it in two parts. On the left, first period, less than uh, until 2000. And on the right, after 2000, you can see a clear difference. So why did I fail? So let's go for the first period until 2000, because at that time I was introducing new techniques of malification and silastic bending. So let's go in the first period the, because of failure that I could identify. I was using mainly corpse in this type of situation. At the moment, as you can see with this slide, we are talking about group A, malice present and stapes. And I always used a port, a partial prosthesis, which was, which was positioned from the malice. I didn't change the position of the malice at that time. And I put the shaft over the stapes head and then trying to place the head underneath the malus, but in many cases, the malus is more or less anterior. So it's sometimes very difficult to place the port. So you have to bend the port anteriorly to reach the malus. In that case, again, we have a, a mobile stapes and a fixed malus. So what I did in the past, I removed the incus and I was cutting the neck of the malus and removing the head of the malus. That's a classical technique, which has been described many times. So that's a, a cutting system, cutting the neck of the malus, and now I remove the head of the malus. And now we get, we get a, a, a mobile malus handle, which is separated from the head. But the problem is that if we have a really anterior malus, the mobile malus handle remains anterior. So uh, we didn't change the position. So then again, we have to bend the prosthesis more or less to reach the malus or we have to just to forget the malice and place the prosthesis underneath the tympanic membrane. But then we lose one point of stability, which is the malice. I think if we have something we need to use, uh, I think the majority of things we have in terms of anatomical condition. So two points of connections are better than one. And if we use the malice plus the stapes, then we have two types, two points of connections. I also use some tricks like uh, vein graft like this, which I try to envelope the uh, prosthesis head like this with uh, a vein graft sticking the prosthesis head to the tympanic membrane to try to increase that. That was a technique which was introduced by Jean-Bernard Corse and I, I thought it was fine, but still we had uh, uh, several prosthesis dislocation. It was not so easy to stabilize it. And if you look to uh, the types of the type of prosthesis I was using during this first period up to 2000, the major, the vast majority of prosthesis which was used was a port, 93% uh, of cases. That's important. We'll come back to that. Like we stay, we keep, we still stay uh, during the first period, trying to study the uh, the cause of failure. So I'm going to look my revision case. Uh, the total number was 305 on Austin Cartouche Group A failures. And I did personal revision in 37 cases. So these 37 cases are definitely personal failures. So that's the point. So I, I will study my first personal revision of this, which is 32 cases, in fact, not 37, 32. No, 37, sorry. First revision of main cause of failure of these 37 cases. That's very interesting. Very interesting to see the, 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 the second part. The main cause of failure that I could identify uh, during this first period from 1991 to 2000, when I was using the old techniques, was a dislocation of prosthesis, 66%. And I remember that sometime when I was doing revision following several previous revisions, I had failure, I came back to revise the patient and I always revised and I found again the recurrent prosthesis dislocation. 
And I was feeling a little bit desperate now to find the possibility to stabilize this bloody prosthesis, which was always moving and dislocated. Although it, there was the stapes, although the, the, the shaft was nicely positioned to the stapes head, but then the head was moving and was not stable. So I was trying to find a, a different way. That was, of course, the synastic bending technique. But you see, short, long prosthesis is, is a very small part of the uh, cause of failure. So the main cause of failure during that first period was dislocated prosthesis. You have to remember that. This is exactly what I mean. On the left, what you can see, this port seems to be fine, but it doesn't work well. There's a lack of energy. You can see when I move the prosthesis, the staple doesn't move well. This is what we call tilting, so it's not that efficient. Same thing with this one. That was a personal revision. The port seems to be fine on nice position, but again, it doesn't work well. I know that there are new port now uh, with uh, Dresden clip, which works better probably, but this is what I had when I was uh, trying to find a way to stabilize this prosthesis. Uh, same on the right, you can see the otoscopy showing the prosthesis, which is dislocated posteriorly, not anymore in contact with the malisendal and becoming in contact with the bony canal wall. And that, that of course, creating problems. Uh, now the second period, because I'm I, for, at the moment, I just want to, to talk about failure. So you remember that my, during my first period of time, the main cause of failure was dislocation. Now the second period, you can see a clear improvement in my success rate. But again, I want to study why I failed, even with these new techniques. And the new technique, of course, as I published many times, speaking a lot of things about that, mileage relocation and silastic bending. I can use the combination of mileage relocation and silastic bending, because in this case, we are still talking about Austin Cartus Group A, presence of mileage and stapes. So that's the technique. First step, of course, is to separate the joint. And here we can see we have a malice fixation, but we have a stapes mobile. So it's not the same as before. It's not the combined stapes malice fixation. So the stapes is mobile here. So first step is to, you remember that I made an incision through the periosteum of the malice until I reached the umbo. So you remember that I always say that the umbo is the most difficult part. So I use this needle and the circle with my left hand. Um, the umbo, sometimes you can make a small tear, but it's always very limited, so it's easy to close it. You need to separate entirely the malice from the tympanic membrane, checking if there is any tear, which is not the case here. This is why I chose this one, just to show you a nice one. Then I remove the incus. It's always better to keep the incus in place because it gives some resistance. The cutting the, the tensor tympani tendon and then over stretching the anterior tympanum malleal ligament, you can see. You can see the position of the hook, which is very close to the neck or to the head of the malleus, because otherwise you can break the malleus. So you reach the resistance of the anterior tympano malleal ligament, which needs to be, which needs to be uh, broken over stretch. And then you can see that the malleus is placed over the stapes head. So now there's a nice vertical position at the end. I'm sticking back the malleus to the tympanic membrane. That's really important. I didn't do that at the beginning and I failed. Now I stick back to the malleus to the tympanic membrane, and then I will measure using an elongated stapes measuring rod. Uh, if we go for a second here, we have here you have. Let me let me come back to this uh, picture, which I think is fine. This is important using uh, an instrument to stick back the malleus to the tympanic membrane, and then measuring. That's an elongated stapes measuring rod. So I stick the malleus back to the tympanic membrane to be sure that I will measure from the right place. This is a longer one. It runs from five to eight. So that's five, six, seven, and you cannot see the eight one. So this is six, so I'm in front of six, but I always add 0 0.5 millimeter when I cut the prosthesis because I have to take into account that there is a groove in the center of the prosthesis head, which is 0 0.5 millimeter deep. So I will cut it at 6.5. That's, that's the point. Uh, okay, let me go back before. And you can see on the right, uh, what we have, uh, what we have on the right is that the different types of prosthesis that I use after uh, 2000. And you can see, remember that the, during my first part, I was mainly use, using port and now you see only Port in 5% of cases. So I use TORPS uh, in the vast majority of cases. So it's a completely different process and technique than before. 
That's the kind of uh, tort made by uh, Grace Medical. I designed this one and you can see that it comes with this elastic band. So I'm introducing now the, the shaft in connection to the stapes full plate. And then I will introduce the malleus within, uh, within the groove like this. And you can see the vertical position of a process. We don't have to bend it. I don't care about the malleus because I choose the position of the malleus in that, in that case. Now, I, it looks good, but I want to attach the prosthesis with the band to increase even more the prosthesis stability. And with this band, the technique is becoming much better than before. It, it's a tricky technique, I, I know. You have to cut the tensor tendon and place the, uh, the sorry, the stapes tendon and place the band underneath the tendon because this will help for avoiding risk of dislocation or lateralization. Of the, and you can see that now they are moving together just like a single unit. It's not the same presentation as the one we had with the port, as I showed you before. There's no more tilting. So that's interesting. And if we look to the, to the reason why I, may, I, I went to this technique of malleus relocation, the point for me was to create a vertical position at the end of the prosthesis. But this paper was very nice, made in 1986. These people were trying to study the influence of this angle called angle alpha, which is the position of the malleus compared to the stapes head. And they shown that the less uh, this angle alpha is, the best is the uh, stability of the prosthesis and efficiency of the prosthesis. They were using laser Doppler interferometer studying the different angle. And of course, if we go for uh, this kind of, uh, of course, uh, type of reconstruction, you can see the dislocation of prosthesis so see. because you can see that the uh, the uh, the uh, malleus is the prosthesis still attached to the malleus, but it's not attached anymore to the stapes because the malleus was anterior. And with the technique of silastic bending, you reduce the uh, sorry the technique of malleus relocation. It's clear that we are reducing this angle up to zero, so the malleus becomes in front of the stapes head, above the stapes head, and then you can just put a, a, a port or incus transposition or torp, but in a vertical position. And I believe in this. That's the difference. On the right, you can see the malleus has been relocated. And now I will put a torp and you see the difference. Again, the, the, the malleus is inserted and then the bend around the stapes head, underneath the tendon, and then at the end, trying to find the best position of the prosthesis. And you see again, they are moving together. All right, so again, these are the different techniques. Now let's go again, as I, as I show you for the first period of time, let's go for the revision and for the failure. What did I fail again? The total number of cases, one, more than 1,600. 1, 1, but if we focus on Austin Cartouche Group A, 400, a little bit more, and the personal failures, 159 cases of Austin Cartouche Group A failures. But I did a first personal revision in 130 cases. So these are now studying the main cause of failure. It means these are the 130 cases that were following previous failed surgery and the previous surgeon was myself. So that's a, clearly a personal failure, 130. And that's very interesting. You remember the previous figure during the first part of uh, my uh, exper experience of life. The main cause of failure was dislocated prosthesis, and now it become short long prosthesis, where dislocated is only 24%. So it's clear that with this technique, it seems that I was able to solve, bracket more or less, the problems of dislocation. But uh, I had to deal with short long prosthesis, and it's interesting because I thought when I was able to revise this failed case, I found that I was uh, having short prosthesis, so the torque was too short. And I know exactly why. It's because I, I didn't take into account the fact that once you relocate the malleus, then you break, you cut the tensor tympani, you overstretch the anterior tympanomalia ligament, so then the malleus is only attached by the superior ligament. It means that there's a tendency to see um, a, a medialization of the malleus handle, and then the, the distance from a foot plate to malleus is not the right one. So I didn't care about that. So I cut the prosthesis at the, 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 the length that I had, and it was too short in these cases. Now I know why I failed. 
I discovered that. So this is the reason why I always point out, like I did before when I was presenting the technique, I stick back the malleus handle to the, to the tympanic membrane to be sure that I will measure from the right length. And since I do that, I decrease the risk of having a problem with the length of prosthesis. So this is why if you come back to my long figure, uh, the, the results have become even better with time. But that's really interesting. And in terms of um, um, dislocated prosthesis, 24%. In that case, the dislocation were related in most of the case um, to erosion of the stapy superstructure. This is one of the problems that I had at the beginning with the silastic band, because now I got this, this prosthesis made by Grace Medical, which is a very nice one because the band is nice and not too tight. But before that, I had to do it myself. So I had to trim myself the band and to make a small one. And this silastic was too strong and probably create necrosis itself. Since now I'm using this prosthesis, the risk of having a, 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 a necrosis is extremely low. So uh, again, that's the point of the short long prosthesis. So I, rem I remind you, I need to stick back the malice to the tympanic membrane prior measuring. Otherwise, if you leave it like this, it's going to be too short. Now, if we compare the two periods in terms of main cause of failure, you can see again the two figures, 66% 66% dislocation on the left and only 24% on the right. So it's a completely different technique. It's a completely different cause of failure. And I believe, I believe it's more easy, I think, if we think about how, we, how to do it, to try to find a solution for problems of short or long processes because it's directly related to your failure rather than trying to solve this problem of uh, recurrent dislocation of prosthesis. You see the difference, completely uh, different. Now, um, if we go to the last decade, 1999 to 2019, you see that uh, the success rate of Austin Cartouche Group A is from 87% to 96%. I had a period of uh, lower success rate. I don't know why, maybe I go depressed or something like that. I don't know, but anyway, it's only a part of my experience. You can see it's quite over 80%, so which is quite good. And it's more than 85. And now we, for the last year, it's 96%, which I think is really good. Of course, we have to have some more follow-up, but the average aspect looks good. Now let's go to group D, which is defined by absence of myelis and stapes in that case. I put a prosthesis like this directly from the tympanic membrane to the foot plate, but it's nothing to hold the prosthesis in this case. This is why I was introducing this technique of uh, malleus replacement prosthesis. If you look to the left, this position, that was the technique I was using before introducing the malleus replacement prosthesis. And of course, we all know that in, in case of, uh, there are several factors influencing the results in terms of ossicle reconstruction. And if you go to literature, it's clear that one of the most important one is the presence or absence of malice. If you look to the papers, it's clear that when the malice is absent, uh, we've got no more than 30%, 35% of success rate, which is extremely low. And I have the same figure. I tried to deal with this using some gel foam to stabilize the shaft of the prosthesis. I was speaking about that with Bill Moret, who was the first to describe the use of port of torps instead of port. Uh, but you see that the prosthesis that that's the problem. The prosthesis that is just underneath the tympanic membrane. There's no more malice here. And there's nothing to hold the prosthesis head. And the shaft, there's nothing to hold it to. Uh, I know that with titanium prosthesis, you can probably increase the, the chance of stability, but still it is not very stable. And the shaft also is not stable. So my idea was to create a point of stability by recreating this uh, uh, malleus using the malleus replacement prosthesis. This prosthesis was defined with Kurz. We defined it together with the engineer called Uwe Steinhardt, which is, who is a very nice person. The point is that we have this Y shape. And I want to insist about that. Having this Y shape is an important point because this gives a lot of flexibility of these processes like this. You can adapt the position of the shaft. And the idea was to recreate a new malleus, which was inserted inside the bony canal wall. You, you can see here, I made two holes. We're gonna go back in, in more detail. And this needs to be covered with cartilage because this process is made in titanium. 
all, all the other prostheses I showed to you were hydroxylapatite prostheses. Hydroxylapatite, we do not need cartilage interposition in the, in the vast majority of cases, whereas uh, titanium we need to. And the other reason why I'm always use, using uh, hydroxylapatite instead of titanium is that I can shape the prosthesis myself. And that's specifically important in, in terms of congenital malformation because you have to uh, deal with very difficult anatom anatomical conditions, very narrow uh, of a window, a middle cleft. And so it's important to be able to reduce the size of a prosthesis head so you can drill out hydroxylapatite uh, in the same way as you drill a bone, and it's not possible with titanium. So let's go with this technique, just to show you this. That's the left ear, typically group D. So I'm checking the full plate, which is mobile. And you see on the right, you can see, the, the, of course, the fascia nerve. And this is the Y shape, again, with the two hooks, 0.4 millimeter diameter for each hook. So I'm performing a first hole through the bony canal wall with a 0.6 millimeter diamond dust burr and the second one for the second hook. Uh, I know that stylistic bending is a difficult technique, but this is a very easy one uh, and easy to perform this hole. So the two hooks are inserted and then you can change the position of the malleus to adapt it to any kind of uh, anatomical condition. Uh, and the, the point is that I will place um, the, the malleus handle over the foot plate and definitely uh, it's clear that you have a better position of the final position of prosthesis because you can you can hold the prosthesis with something uh, rather than if you don't have any malleus handle and then th that's the problem. Now um, let's go to what I had since 1994, first case of of Sim cartouche group D up to 2019, and you can see uh, on the right part of this diagram that I got clearly an in a reverse position of my results. At the beginning up to, from 1994 to 2006, I had much, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, main, the main results were failure and on the right, it's completely different. I, I, I got much better result than I had before. So that's interesting to see that. You can divide this diagram in two parts, good results on the right, bad results on the left. On the left, this is exactly according to what is usually published with the previous techniques. So let's go and compare the success rate and the failure rate between these two periods of time on Austin Cartouche Group D. Before, uh, during that, my first period, uh, that was before 2010, where, because I introduced the technique of malice replacing prosthesis in 2010, and I published it in laryngoscope. 30, only 34% of success rate when I was not using the malice prosthesis, I put in prosthesis directly underneath the drum. And now with the malice replacing prosthesis in this Austin cartouche group D, I got 75% of success rate. You can go in and see my publication because it was statistically significant. So I just finished my presentation. I hope you like it, but just before finishing it, I just want to remind you because maybe some of you just came uh, in the middle of my presentation. We have this big event in May to replace the original one. This is called Doctors United for Worldwide Education. The point will be to have a hub in Utrecht, which will be driven by uh, Wilco Groman, who is the president of Lion. On one side, we will have the speakers. They will be in specific conditions uh, uh, and they will uh, show their experience, discuss their experience with uh, not live surgery, of course, we cannot do it but this will be a lot of interesting points. And on the right, you can see uh, the list of speakers that will be invited for this uh, big event. They will speak from their own place, of course. And uh, on the other side, they will be, I hope, yourself connected to us using this uh, interactive uh, Lion virtual conference hall, which will be uh, built up by Wilco Groman. And you need to register going to the Lion website lion-web.org and you will find a page for that on the front page and then you can register and uh, you will you will receive all information to be able to about that about the, about the, the program I, I just want to remind you that the first day uh, 18 is dedicated to cochlear implant and the second one dedicated to uh, middle ear reconstruction okay thank you very much uh, for some people who would like to come to see me just use these two email and when the a very bad time we, ha we are facing now with the COVID-19 will end. 
because there will be an end, of course, we don't know when, but there will be one, then we can meet again. So we'll be very happy to receive you. So if you want to come, just send email to this, uh, two emails, both, use both together, and then we can uh, do our best. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, a few questions, can we end it with a few questions, please? Sure, no problem. Uh, yeah. Okay, we have a question from, there is one more Minesh in India, who's an ENT surgeon also, in case you're not aware. Uh, is he better, than, he, you? Is he better uh, than you? Or? Uh, everyone is better than me. I don't see anyone uh, I can be better than. But uh, he asks that just like you have a criteria of 10 decibels hearing loss uh, as a failure sometimes in, in autosclerosis, do you have any criteria for uh, calling an osteoclerosis a failed procedure? Yeah, that's an, a very good question, to be honest. I, I do agree with him. We define uh, by a common agreement that the failure uh, is 20 dB, uh, over 20 dB of airborne gap. But I, I, I fully agree that it should be probably 10 dB because the patient uh, is not so happy with 20 dB. But it's also depend, depending on the opposite ear. So there's a lot of things that we can work on that. And I, I, I describe a technique to... Uh, to uh, to use the other ear average uh, air and bone connection to be able to compare both sides together. But uh, I, I believe if we would be very honest, we should use 10 dB. Right, thank you. There's, there's one more question from Dr. Adit Yolekar. He asks, uh, what according to you, you is the best way to preserve the corda? Is there any specific way you pre preserve, prevent damage to the corda tympani? I, I don't have a specific way. I cannot show that in, in this case, but I have a, a very small hook. It's called, um, let me, um, I don't have a picture of that, but it's called, yeah. um, I call that strong hook. It's a stupid name, but I, I call it like this. So that's a hook like this. And at the end, there is a small teeny hook. And I use this hook to go into the uh, canal of the quarter tympani. I go inside and I break the bone and I open up a little bit more the bony canal wall, and then I can uh, elevate a little bit more uh, the corda. But of course, uh, it's not easy, and it happens to me that we have corda tympani uh, problems. But it's strange, but sometimes you cut it and the patient doesn't complain, and uh, something preserve it. Well, Dr. Vijendra commonly says that it is his female patients who complain more than the males, because males have no taste anyways. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's a question from Dr. Bini Desai, she asks, how do you exactly know the position of the malleus replacement process in the ear canal? How do you define that? Any specific measurement you do? Uh, to, 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 to mean the, the, the position of the malleus replacement process? That's well, right. I always, I always try to place it in, in its uh, natural position of the malleus, which means at 12 o'clock. But sometimes, and specifically for in cholesteatoma surgery, there's no more bone in the attic area, so we have to put it on the other side. And I, I have a very nice uh, video on that, showing that we can drill out the bone at, let's say, six o'clock, opposite to the normal position of the malleus. And then I, I thin it. Uh, you need to thinner the bone, and then at the end you insert that. So you can. By the way, by create, you need to create a chamber for the for the two hooks, and then you can place it everywhere. It's not a problem. Right. Uh, one more question from here is that, do you have any experience of any incus repositioning which people are doing or have been doing uh, when it comes to the hearing improvement? Are these implants much more superior to the hearing compared to the old style incus, incus repositioning used? Yeah, we are using more and more uh, prosthesis now since many years, but yeah. incus repositioning when it's well done is very nice, of course, it works very well for sure. Yes. Uh, we, we have a, a, a very dynamic autologist from India, Dr. Madhuri Mehta. She's here Hi, and, uh, and she can ask you a question directly. Yes, Dr. Madhuri, please. Hello, welcome. Yes, yes. Hi, uh, hello, Minesh. How are you? Good evening. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you so much. Hello, Dr. Vincent. This is Dr. Madhuri. Hello. I've, uh, yes, Dr. Vincent. I've been glued to the screen watching every aspect, whatever you are sharing with you. Thank you, Pidas. Thank you very much, sir. I have a question for you. Yeah. But do you get failures from due to formation of fibrotic bands and adhesions around ossicular, newly constructed ossicular chain? And how do you handle that? And do you use elastic sheets to avoid adhesion formation in future? Uh, you mean when I use this elastic band, the problem of uh, uh, tissue surrounding that? Is that your question? Yeah, I mean, uh, many a times, the glial mucosa is a bit eroded. It is not found intact. In those cases, when you do osteoculoplasty or use any processes or the natural incurs, do you get failures due to formation of adhesions 
around for fibrotic bands around them and how do you treat them do you change the uh, quality of uh, this quality of the processes do you use elastic sheet or what well yes i use if i have a feeling that there is not very nice mucosa i use elastic sheet and i leave it forever it's not a problem uh, but you know in many cases we have this kind of adhesive bands uh, not very much around the elastic but it could even uh, uh, occurs around any type of process you are you you are using but i must say that in my experience i don't believe it creates real issue in terms of uh, process stability um, mobility because these adherents are soft in most of the cases but if i have to revise and if i find that i cut them of course but to prevent that it's very difficult i don't have a key point i use elastic uh, and i place the elastic sheet uh, in the middle here sure oh, yes thank you uh, there are a few more questions. Uh, one is a very important question. Well, I know the answer, but I know because I've heard you many times, but I want you to tell uh, what is the role of a CT scan in a revision osteoclastic or in a, in a primary stapy surgery? Do you do it for all cases, especially for medical legal purposes, or uh, you do it just because you want to get some more information? Yeah, for primary stapy surgery, I do it only for medical legal question because we have to do it. So I have to do it. And I, I strongly don't believe it's a nice thing because we put CT scan to everybody and we need CT scan only for very few of them because these uh, days and uh, this um, uh, semicircular distance is extremely rare. Otherwise, if we do revision, then I would ask for a CT scan for the moment, okay? Um, now the, uh, for articuloplasty, uh, well, yeah, if, if clearly, if clinically I have a very nice tympanic membrane, clear special history, uh, we don't really need a CT scan, but we have to ask in, in most of the cases, specifically when we have a history of cholesteatoma, if, even when the, the aspect is nice. So, but uh, that's what we have to do. We have to do it. Yes. Uh, again, a good question from Dr. Jagdish Naik from Oman. He asked, uh, do you find any adhesive changes in revision or cycloplastic cases? Do you, do you find what? Uh, any adhesive changes, adhesions uh, in the revision or cycloplastic you've seen? Additions uh, as a cause of failure. Yes. Not really. I found I found in, in many cases some additions, of course, but I don't believe the addition band uh, would be the cause of a problem because they are very soft. In most, I, I, of course, I cut them, but uh, no, I don't find them. Yes. Uh, I get a question from uh, Dr. Mondi Hamad. He asked that uh, do you also analyze the eustachian tube dysfunction or function prior to a revision case? Uh, that's a, a good point, but I don't know how to analyze the station tube function. It's a clinical uh, feeling when you can see, the, the, of course, the aspect of the tympanic membrane. If we have a poor station tube function, then we have a retracted tympanic membrane, and it's always very bad. Whatever you do, you cannot fight. I, I, I really believe it's very difficult to fight against uh, a station tube dysfunction. The only way would be to, of course, uh, reinforce the tympanic membrane with black or cartilage. But in that case, of course, you decrease the risk of uh, recurrence, but you decrease the incidence of a good uh, result because it's creating some airborne gap. So I don't have uh, much uh, influence on that. Yeah. But it's, uh, one more question from Dr. Sudeep Das is, uh, would you usually remove the incus in most cases uh, where you feel uh, uh, there is even a mild necrosis because you, in all the processes, uh, uh, the incus has been removed in many cases. Is that a, a criteria which you use? Not always. If I have a partially eroded incus, I would keep the incus intact because when I compare my result with or without incus, my success rate is better with the incus, of course. So it's always better to keep the incus. But if I have a partially eroded incus, I would use what I call the bucket prosthesis. I don't have one Yes, here. We, we know but that. It, we know that, yes. It's like this, you know, it doesn't go around the, the, the incus like this. It goes like underneath this. the lenticular yes. process. So then you can preserve the increase more. Right. One question I want to ask for my personal uh, uh, is that, what do you counsel the patient prior to an osteoclastic? Because the expectations of patients might vary in different places, different age groups. So what do you tell them and what kind of hearing are you able to give them? Uh, you mean prior surgery, right? Prior, prior to the surgery, yes. Oh, first of all, I always show them, of course, the uh, audiogram. And I explain to the patient the audiogram and I show him uh, how much we could improve the hearing up to the bone conductions. I have to explain the inner ear, the middle ear. They have to understand exactly how much they can win. And also I, I, I compare the opposite ear 
For example, I said this is uh, we can get that, we can get that, but we can also get even if the, the opposite year is low, then we can go up to the same level and they were at the same level, which is important for you. That's the kind of thing that you have to discuss. And also sometimes it's a mild improvement, but this will allow the patient to wear hearing aids, so the, which is good because sometimes they have 90% uh, of, 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 uh, of hearing loss. If you go up to 45%, then, then you can put a hearing aid, not with 90%. So that's a lot of different things according to the situation. Well, well, well one question from a lot of Indians, including me. Is there any way we can get the cost prosthesis and the brace medical prosthesis and the silastic band at a cheaper rate? I would love to give you for nothing, but unfortunately, that's, it's not my point. I already discussed that a lot with the people from, from America. This guy yeah. from Grace Medical Company, they are very nice people. I must say I, must say I work with many companies uh, in terms of obstacle reconstruction. And um, the Grace Medical Company is a beautiful one. It's a small one, but they are very active and they take care of yourself. You can have them, talk to them, etc. So I push them to have a better contact to India. They have a representative in India, for sure. They have yes, one. They do. Yes. It doesn't seem to be efficient. And that's the point. And the point would be to change that, to have a, a direct access rather than moving by someone. So I, I promise I, I, I keep going on like this to improve that because <laughs> I'm traveling and doing this technique live, sometime with life surgery. So yeah. they know they could have a better result and they know they could, they could get a decreasing the price for you to have, like they do for cochlear implantation in some countries, it's not the same yes. price. They yes. should for sure, for sure. Yeah. Okay, the last few questions. One is, uh, 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 what is the protocol by Dr. Suresh Balani? He asks, what is the protocol in osteoplasty in cases of patients who are operated cleft palate patients to a normal? Would you still have the same protocol when you're a cleft palate patient? Cleft palate, cleft palate, yeah. right? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, would, I would use the same protocol because there's no way to uh, change something. The problem, of course, is the eustachian tube dysfunction in this case, but there's no way to change that. So I, I try to... To, to do the surgery, and then, very surprisingly, sometimes we have good results with that. We, we cannot predict, so I always do the same. Yes, uh, there's two questions from Dr. Rajiv Pachuri and Dr. Dharmishta. Is that when you put in the vein graft in stapes surgery, what number of suction cannula are you using? The diameter. The di diameter. Yes, I use 0 0.9, 0 0.9 millimeter diameter sucker to grab the vein, or to uh, and to introduce the vein within the the, the, the upper window, and right. if I suck the fluid before introducing the uh, the vein graft. I use a 0 0.7 millimeter diameter, but for the vein is 0 0.9, and the, right. for for the prosthesis, I introduce the prosthesis is 0 0.9 or sometimes 1.2 millimeter. Right. Uh, just the last one or two questions. Uh, in in uh, the extrusions which you have had, what do you think? Have you had what the most common cause of an extrusion? I mean, I know you have hydroxypatite, which, which prevents a reduced extrusion, but what according to you was the most common cause of extrusion for others to learn? Uh, because the, main problem, one is... because the problem which we have in India is for me also personally, I have been using the prosthesis, you know, but because of the cost factor, if it gets extruded, it becomes a bit difficult to face the patient. And it's uh -huh. though we tell them, yes. So, yeah, yeah, I know that. But the, 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 the main uh, factor is eustachian tube for sure, because you can see this patient having good result and then progressively the tympanic membrane retracting and nicely, you know, adapting the, the shape of the prosthesis, but with time it, it comes to uh, extrusion. Uh, the other thing sometimes it's because you cut the prosthesis too long. It happened to me, so I know that. Uh, but the, the, the main cause, I think, is eustachian tube. So in that case, well, the, again, the same problem would be to cover with uh, 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 per, um, cartilage. But, you know, uh, if I have a, a trophic tympanic membrane, even if, if the tympanic membrane is closed without perforation, then I will use a perichondrium gra graph in all cases. And uh, one question by Dr. Jayanta, he asked that uh, in comparison to a homograft and a prosthesis, you always felt that the prosthesis has a much better hearing result. Um, I, I cannot say that again, because I want to be honest. I don't have experience so much as uh, the agenda has. So, you know, 
I cannot, I cannot say that. I feel that I would be better with prosthesis rather than uh, increased transposition, but I know that increased transposition would give excellent result too. It's clear for me. Uh, one of the things that I had uh, that I have seen is that when we revise uh, cases uh, where the previous surgeon was using increased transposition, sometimes you have a bony ankylosis between the incus and the stapes head, and then if you want to remove that, uh, it, it's become very tricky. We, we don't have the same thing with a prosthesis. Right, right. Uh, well, Dr. Ashim asked that uh, after a case of an otitis media who's been operated, uh, may like cholesteatoma, when do you decide to go in for a prosthesis as a stage procedure? Is there a time period to look, three months, six months, or a year? Not really. For cholesteatoma, we do, uh, Ashim knows that, we, we, we do at the clinic, we reconstruct uh, during the first stage. The first because stage itself. We do osteoplasty always in the first stage. Because now we have the MRI CT scan, we, which allows us to be able to follow the evolution of the cholesteatoma without doing a second stage all the time. So we, we, we do osteoplasty even on the first stage. Right. Uh, uh, one more question is, uh, of all the processes which you have had, uh, do you have the malleus replacement processes which is there, which would give always a much better result uh, then compared to any of the uh, the uh, direct processes from the from the old winter to the tympanic membrane, but I think it's I think it's it's a very uh, simple thing to understand that if you put a prosthesis like this, for example, like uh, the contraction like this, if you have nothing, then you put the prosthesis on the foot plate like this. There's nothing to stabilize the shaft first. Otherwise, you can use a shoe, but it's not perfect because then you need to stabilize the shoe, so it's a different point. But anyway, there's nothing to stabilize the prosthesis there. And if you put it underneath the drum, there's nothing to stabilize the prosthesis. If you put something here, it's clear that it's going to be better. I'm not saying it's 100%, but I mean, it's a question of logic. If you have something to hold a little bit of prosthesis like this, rather than nothing, it's better. So it's I think better. it's better. Yes, we have a lot of questions, but I don't think we are going to have time for all of them. Otherwise, we would have dinner. Piagendra wants to say something. I can see him, Piagendra. Can you open up this uh, microphone? Oh, she, 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 can you unmute Dr. Vijendra, please? Yes, sir. Can you unmute Dr. Vijendra, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir, please. Congratulations. It was an excellent show. Hats off to the master. Vincent is a master of stapes and ossicular plasty. What he showed us uh, amazing things and hats off to him. And the most important thing is he has shared his failure rates. That is really unique and hats off to him. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your, honestly sharing your all the failure rates. It's a Thank really you. good task. Thank you so much. Thank you, Via General. That's nice to be with you again. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I thank you again. And a uh, last few requests is that, are you going to accept coming on a webinar again here? <laughs> oh yeah, I can do that. I'm happy to do it. it yeah. you know, I, to be honest, I have nothing to do at the moment because the, the, the <laughs> surgery is uh, not doing well. I don't see too many patients. So it's great for the brain to do things like that and to be linked together, fighting against this the fucking... Uh, right. Uh, COVID-19. Right. I mean. So I thank you again. Thank you again for being here. Thank you again for being an inspiration. We had more than 500 people logged in and all of them were eagerly uh, watching you. And uh, thank you for being here. And I thank Zaydis, uh, Mr. Shishir, uh, Mr. Bhalirao, all of them are here. I request all the audience also that all of you are going to have a feedback poll on your screens. So you all can write something good about me. I know it's difficult, but you all can try uh, <laughs> something good about the whole program, though Professor Vincent won't really agree. And uh, you can just tell us how it was. So help us to get better. And uh, thank you, Dr. Vijendra, sir. Uh, for me, it's a blessing to have two of my teachers at the same sitting. So what more a student can want? You know, so we have two people who have taught me so much at the same time. And uh, both of them are uh, having sometimes different views. But what I want to tell the juniors here is that you have to understand the respect they have for each other in light of maybe not doing the same thing. So that's very important for us to understand in today's day when you have friendship, you have humanity, you have humility. It's good to understand and respect each other and accept and appreciate each other's efforts. So again, Professor Vincent, yeah, you have to say something? 
Yes, just remind the people uh, from all this very nice group that we are planning this big thing in May. I hope you'll be able to join with us. Yes, yes. And uh, hopefully, if uh, uh, Sir agrees, I would be a part of it also. Uh, he changes his mind once in a week, but I think he would, he would accept and uh, allow me to be a part. And uh, we hope a large gathering of Indian ENT doctors would be a part of the webinar in, uh, in line. And we would help in coordinating it in, in, in further as well. So it would be great. One last, last month again, again, I want to thank you very much, Manesh, for organizing this. I want to, to thank also Shishi, who was very nice with me, helping me prepare thank, this kind thank of thing. Thank you, lot, sir. And thank I, I was extremely happy to be with you. As usual, uh, you know, my connection with India is a, it's a very strong yeah, one. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. And uh, it's a pleasure to see all these people and friends mm -hmm. via Jeff. Uh, and to have Hashim also connected, you and all my friends. I mean, it's it's a pleasure. It's not a problem for me to be there. I'm happy about that. And it's uh, and I hope you and your family good health. The, the only thing is that you will get bored because I'm talking about the same thing since many, many, many years now. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's, 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 it's always good to learn from you. That I, I mentioned the same thing the other day. Each time I see you or Dr. Vijendra, I come back home knowing how less I know. So that is an important point to understand, you know, so the, but I don't like to see you too often, otherwise I would get depressed. So I would leave you and all together. But uh, apart from this, uh, it's so nice to be here and I hope you and the family stay safe. I wish all the delegates also the same and I hope Dr. Vijendra also stays safe at home. And uh, I we wish that we would all connect together. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you again. Thank you. It was a pleasure for me. And warm regards to everyone in France. I will. Your family, all the people at home, and hope you are going to be healthy once again. I hope so. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> you. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Manish. Thanks. Thanks a lot for extending your support and help. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.